فقدر ثم فقدر ثم نظر ثم عبس وبسر ثم أدبر واستكبر فقال إن هذا إلا سحر أن يؤتى صحفا منشرة كلا بل لا يخافون الآخرة كلا إنه تذكرة فمن شاء ذكره وما يذكرون إلا أن يشاء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وأصلي على رسول الكريم الله أصلي على محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وألقي السحرة الساجدين وألقي السحرة الساجدين وألقي السحرة الساجدين So today I'm going to show you a video of a sorceress a female who uh, has been doing magic on Muslims and on the Muslim Ummah. But, uh, so there's a lot of topics I'm gonna discuss, but first I'm gonna start off with this video about this sorceress. By the way, just so everybody knows, I had one of my uh, Russian friends uh, verify that the translation is accurate, number one. My wife's sister's friend, who also knows Russian, also verified for me uh, that the translation that they did in these videos is accurate. Um, so let's, with that, now begin. <clears throat> so this lady is going to start off talking about why, so I'm going to try to explain different aspects, but she's going to be talking about from her perspective, why it's hard to do magic on Muslims. Okay. And, uh, and we're going to just finish this. And then I'm going to show you another video where there's another group of magicians. We're going to talk. So that'll be two gentlemen that are magicians. This is a lady. And then if we have time, I don't think we will, but if we have time, we might try to do this whole video. But I, I doubt if we're going to get to that point. So we'll see. Okay. So let's start with where she is, and then we'll go to that other video. So let me know if you're able to hear what she's saying. Work on him. So when a person is drunk, he... Yes, definitely. Does the amount of alcohol matter? Sure. So now, uh, when a person is drunk, you know, the Quran says, wa innahu min amalu The uh, the That being drunk is from the actions of shaytan. So she's talking about how it's easier to do magic on someone that is drunk, okay? So just keep this in mind. Okay. If a person is drunk, he sleeps. He has no control over himself. He loses awareness. So he's already vulnerable. Basically, alcohol lowers vibrations instantly. Then it is easier to work. It is easier to attach an entity. And it is easier to take possession of a person's mind. Does it mean that it's more difficult to influence a person if he keeps his thoughts in purity? Yes, absolutely. When faced with various religions, it is very difficult to influence Muslims. They are in a constant connection with the aggregor. They do namaz every day and read prayers on a daily basis. They are constantly under some kind of a dome, so it is very difficult to influence them. When you start impacting a person, he begins to address in a prayer. Indeed, many of them are very different from those who come to church only when everything is bad in their life. They come to pray, and then for five years they forget about God, some canons, and so on. Muslims, as a rule, passionately believe and passionately give energy to their aggregor, and this aggregor protects them very well. That's why it is very difficult to work to make any kind of influence on a true Muslim believer. Is this some kind of a good egregore? Well, for them, yes. This egregore is good for adepts who contribute good energy to it. How do you sense it? For instance, you have found an energy trace of such person. What's next? Do you try to drag him somehow to visualize this threat and you fail? Or how do you do that? It disappears. I cannot get a grip on it. I focus on it, but something immediately knocks me out of the flow, just like that. Or I visualize a person in front of me clearly and can affect him even at a mental level, but some image is not created in my mind at all. I even look at a photo, reproduce an image, but it vanishes from my mind. Thus, I can clearly see that a person is covered with something. Does this only work with Muslims? It does for me. Nowadays, there are very few people among Christians who truly believe, even those who write in their comments that God is in the soul, that they are all faithful believers, but in reality they are not. Even most often they write that all this is a sin, but then ask in a private message how to make a robin spell. Such cases also happen. A robin spell? A robin spell. 
What is it? It means pulling a flock or some benefits, beauty, money, success. In other words, pulling off something good from another person. There is shifting when we dump some crap on someone else, and there is pulling when we take something good from another person. Jana, could you please tell us if there are people to whom you cannot connect or influence them by various magic methods in any way? So before we go there, let me now explain what she said. <coughs> She says some very interesting things. Now, when they do magic, now, before I go further, I want to mention, like, for example, my field, psychology, right? One of the things the modern world has done, and I think this is a very important subject that needs to be further investigated, but I'm only going to give you a glimpse of the issue. And after that, at another time, I might raise up this issue uh, at another time. And that is that, for example, in the field of psychology, there are only certain fields within psychology that the mainstream world, as it is currently, will accept. Like, for example, if you did your PhD, and you can, you can do your PhD in paranormal psychology. Uh, paranormal psychology, for example, I'll, I'll tell you an example of one person who did his PhD because uh, like, for example, University of Virginia, this person who did his PhD on paranormal psychology. So for example, uh, this person looked at in, in the state of Virginia, uh, 2,500 children that claimed that they were from another life, meaning from an Islamic interpretation, that would mean that some jinn that was previously with someone else is now with this person, and telling this person, oh, you're from a previous life, okay? So this is paranormal psychology. Paranormal psychology is something people can study, but it's not promoted. It's not something, this person that studied this field will not be allowed to be a clinician, okay? He will not be allowed to uh, help people with whatever uh, problems that they normally would have. Another example is of paranormal psychology, for example, somebody who studied uh, end of life experiences, okay? Uh, somebody who studied that, did a PhD even on that, but uh, is that's, that's kind of like seen as, uh, yeah, that's, you know, pretty cool. That's, that's okay, that's interesting, but it's not authentic, okay? So they've done this in various fields, not just in psychology, but across the board, like in medicine, for example. Um, this is, like I said, a field that needs to be studied, uh, which fields the West has allowed to promote and which fields that even though there is a strong academic uh, uh, tradition or a strong academic uh, evidence for its usefulness, even though there is strong academic uh, proof, or I won't say academic, I'll say scholarly, even though there's strong scholarly proof that it has academic value, but the West doesn't accept it, okay? What are those subjects? Well, there are many of those subjects, and that's a very important thing to look at. Well, um, <clears throat> now, so, so, okay, I wanted to say that. Now, uh, how that relates to magic and how that relates to uh, different things is like this. Those subjects that take us to the understanding of jinns, whether it be, for example, in medicine, or whether it be in the field of psychology or any other field for that matter, those fields that give us a better understanding of, uh, of God, of spirituality, of shaitan, of the occults, whatever you might want to call it, those fields are usually looked down upon, right? Even though uh, the globalists will use them for their own purposes, but will not allow the mainstream world to uh, benefit from that, those ideas. Okay. So now this lady that was saying that doing magic on Muslims is hard. Why is she saying this? She's saying this because her jinns or her clients uh, have told her to do so. And she's found it very difficult. And uh, she feels, and she's, what she's saying is that she sees an aggregore, a dome around these Muslims that's protecting them, okay? Uh, this is very similar to this verse of the Quran that I'll show you. And then we'll go back 
and uh, look at this maybe in more detail after I show you this particular verse. <coughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, In ayah number six, uh, and Allah will punish the hypocritical men and the hypocritical women. And the pagan men and the pagan women. They, uh, this is actually a good translation. They harbored evil thoughts about Allah. They didn't have a good opinion about Allah. And around them is an is an evil circle. Da'ira literally means a circle. Okay. It comes in Quran in many instances. Da'ira means a circle. Alayhim upon them. Da'ira so is an evil circle, meaning there is something around all of us that is a form of uh kind of like our aura, right? Our atmosphere, our aura. Uh, who we are, okay, and it surrounds us. And this point is made in the Quran a few times. Now, this ayah is very interesting in that sense that when a magician plans to do magic, let's see, they see my picture, and and by the way, you know where this sorceress is sitting? She's sitting in Ukraine, in Kiev. Okay, this is where the many sorcerers of the world are. By the way. Uh, and this is important if you go into some of the other aspects of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and where they come from, the Khazari Empire and Ukraine being the uh, same area as the Khazari Empire. Okay. Anyway, moving on. So on anyone is like a type of protection around a person. Okay. And when uh, a person is doing their adhkar, doing their prayers, doing their du'as, your aura, your da'ira, your circle that's around you affects you. So if there is an evil circle, then it allows certain things. It allows, I'll use the word energy. I like the word energy. Because what I want to do is to help us understand that like last time we talked about the jinns and the parasites and the gut and its relationship to the brain and how the jinn uses all that to affect the brain, okay? Today, we're going to understand the other side of this and how that, how the different energy states, you can say, how the different energy levels uh, relate to the situation of the person in terms of the jinn, meaning the jinn, as you'll see now. Um, oh, this is Sutul Fatr, ayah number six. Alayhim <laughs> da'iratu Okay, now let's go back to the video. And I'll explain more things soon. There are such people. If there is ritual protection on a person, it's not even possible to connect through cards. If someone has put ritual protection over him or if an entity <coughs> is in a person's service. Ritual is like ritual prayer. Okay, so what she specifically means by ritual, who are the people who do most rituals? Muslims. So she's saying if you're doing rituals, you have a ritual protection. So you have a lot of protection around you. Now, one thing I want to clarify uh, before we go forward is that would this magician not see, like, for example, in the case of Prophet Musa, والسلام, the magicians, they came, they did their magic, Musa والسلام, through his staff, and it ate up their magic. They realized, wait. This is not magic. This is the truth, right? And then Allah says, وَأُلْقِيَ السَّحْرَةُ sajidin And the, the magicians, they bowed down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did sujood. وَأُلْقِيَ السَّحْرَةُ sajidin قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ هَارُونَ وَمُوسَى And we believe in the Rabb of Harun and the Rabb of Musa alayhi So they saw this is not magic. But what is being told to these magicians, a lot of them, including this lady perhaps, as you'll see, um, that, oh, what Muslims do, that's just another form of magic. So you have a form of magic, but Muslims have another form of magic. Number one. Number two, 
they don't see it as, oh, it's very hard to do magic on the Muslims, so therefore they must be on the truth. They must be the opposite of Satan. They don't look at it like that. They look at it like this. They look at it as it is difficult to get Muslims. And the reason is because you get more brownie points with the shaitan. You get higher brownie points. You get like more rewards from shaitan to attack a Muslim. And they're very difficult. And so if you want a higher rank, you have to be good enough to get a Muslim, right? You have to perfect your art, as I'll explain that in a little bit later. You have to perfect your art so that you can even get a Muslim, okay? Put it that way. Then now you have higher ranks. So now this lady, uh, she doesn't look at it as, oh, they must be on the truth. She looks at it as it's a harder target for me to get a higher rank. So just so you're... Uh, understanding that world that they're coming from. It is also difficult to do that. It happens that a person has a strong ancestral protection. He has a powerful, prosperous, rich kin from generation to generation. And even looking at the cards, you cannot read information from him. He is covered as impenetrable. It happens. You touched upon an interesting point that when a person experiences strong emotion, he opens up to the invisible world. But what if a person diligently works on himself, controls himself, and doesn't even allow any of the low qualities to manifest? Mm -hmm. Now, what she's about to say here is extremely important because it is your willpower and your morality that comes in the way of their magic and the suggestions of shaitan, okay? Uh, so let her say it, and then I'll explain it the same thing in a different way. Uh, hopefully, it'll make sense. Does it mean that he belongs to a category of people to whom it's impossible to do anything by means of magic rituals? Nothing is impossible. There are difficulties. There are points that you've mentioned where it would be difficult to work with such a person. It would take a lot of manipulation to break his will. This is energy consuming and not every practitioner will be breaking through that door for so long. Someone will just say, hell with it, he doesn't give in. There are such cases. Is it possible that he will never give in? Did you have such cases in your practice? I had, once. There was a man who didn't give in at all. He felt a strong impact, but didn't give in. Were you personally acquainted with him, or did you get his photo, roughly speaking? No, how to say, it was an order, but I met this person once. That man was an athlete, very hard-tempered, and he had self-control, a really tough one. Athletes and military men may have such a temper. His willpower was at such a level that it was very difficult to work with him, even through evil spirits. In the end, I refused. Self-control at the level of emotions, right? Yes, discipline, self-control, the man controlled and distinguished his thoughts from alien ones. Hazes had no effect on him, he was fully aware. So notice what she's saying here. That person who can distinguish, these are my thoughts versus this is not my shaykh, this is not my thoughts, subhanAllah, I can't, I wouldn't think that, right? You know yourself that well, Pers a person who has no morality has no boundaries. So if any thought comes to them, they don't know, they'll be like, oh, that's my thought. You know, I'm just having these weird thoughts. But a person who has boundaries, has moral bounds, he's going to know, I, I would not do that. I would not think of killing that person. Like, I don't know why I'm having these thoughts. That's from shaitan. And when he's praying, he's getting alien thoughts. So he's getting, he's getting trained. And this training of knowing that I wouldn't think this, or I wouldn't do this, or I wouldn't, like, if I have a thought, let's say, drink alcohol, right? I have a thought, drink alcohol. Well, I wouldn't do it. Why? Because I, there is a filter that I've, there's a judgment, there's a morality I've been taught over the years of my life for the last 50 years, taught don't drink alcohol. So if some small suggestion comes in my mind, it's, it's not going to be something even noticeable. But if a person has no boundaries, has no morality, and shaitan says something to him, and that person has no boundaries and no filter, then what will happen? Then uh, he will, he may go with that flow. Okay. Uh, I will explain this more as, as we, as she uh, explains this in a little bit more detail. Where such people are very difficult to work with. There are such people indeed. What do you mean by the word awareness? When a person understands that something is wrong with him, that he goes against his principles. Let's say he will never cheat on his wife. He has the principle that if there is one, then it's forever. I attach an entity that pushes him. You should cheat. You should sleep with that female client. And his principle. Now, notice how this is so interesting. What does the Quran, which magic does the Quran specifically refer to? The magic of separating husband from wife. Why? Because it has to do with emotions, has to do with uh, manipulating people, manipulating energies, manipulating thought. 
manipulating the energy level of the person, right? By attaching a jinn, what happens? You get more negative thoughts. And so you can say the first phase, right? The first phase of teaching someone magic is the phase of teaching them how to separate a husband and wife. That's like, okay, you know how to separate husband and wife. You're now like, you're, you're like a powerful magician. And then now you will do other things like, okay, how to bring uh, medical problems to this person, how to like do other, manipulate the energy levels, even in different ways uh, beyond just separating husband and wife. What does Quran do? Quran gives you a certain energy, energy level, right? That overtakes those negative energies. So this, like the Quran is the counter to the negative energies. So everything is energy, right? Everything is waves. Waves, energy is waves. We know this even in terms of quantum physics. We know this in terms of uh, the, the physical world we live in. Everything is in movement. Everything is in a wave. Everything is moving. There's a certain energy. So these entities called jinns, they get attached. And if we get time, we'll talk about the other video where they talk about how the jinn attaches himself to a specific person. So now let's continue. Principles definitely take over. That's what awareness is about. A person doesn't succumb to any provocations that are imposed on him and intended to break his will. But if someone is already attached to him, can these principles not be of his own? That's exactly where awareness comes in. You realize, how come these principles not be mine my whole life? You mean who am I, right? Right. I lived my whole life with this. Where do these thoughts come from? When a person begins to turn on such a protective element, he immediately weakens the effect of an entity or a haze. A protective element is a search for oneself, isn't it? Yes, it means to be on. You know, it's like hypnosis. When they begin to put us into hypnosis, but we catch this moment and start reciting a poem in our mind, for example, we thus immediately interrupt the state of induced hypnosis. The same is true when working with magic. When a person begins to realize that something is wrong with him, delve into himself, try to control his emotions and follow his principles. It is very difficult to work with him. Okay, so let me explain this this way. So um, let's say you're watching TV, you're in a trance state, right? You're in the movie, you have lost awareness of yourself. It's a type of hypnosis, but it's we call it a trance state. So you're in a trance state, you see her moving, you're seeing, you're seeing a movie, you're enjoying the movie, but all of a sudden what happens? A dirty scene comes up. Because it goes against your principle, you automatically come back to your real self, your physical self. So you can press the remote control button to forward the scene, whatever it is, right? So what happens? When something goes against your principle, what happens? It uh, takes you out of the hypnotic state. It takes you out of the trance state. Because why? There's a filter within us that kind of like wakes us up. So now a person who, there's some magic is being done on that person, uh, what happens? Uh, he's having these thoughts, but he knows these thoughts go against his morality. So because they go against his morality, he actually is more aware of the fact that something is like these thoughts, they're not mine. I don't want these thoughts. But when these thoughts keep coming back, he's going to be like, what's wrong with me? He's going to start reading Quran, doing dua, doing salah, right? So you have to be aware of your awareness. Like for example, obsessive uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder is part of this, right? Shaitan's playing with a person, tells you, oh, you, your wudu, like very common scenario is your wudu is, maybe you didn't do your wudu right. So they go back into their wudu. And there's some people they'll do their wudu up to like 20 times, 30 times because Shaitan keeps playing with them to frustrate them, right? To make their, uh, to make them weak to change their energy levels. So this is what happens. So anyway, uh, this lady was giving an example of a husband and a wife. Husband is being taught, told, cheat on your wife. You'll see this. And um, and, and the thought comes, cheat on your wife. But he's he would never think of cheating his wife. This is against Islam. So immediately, that is deflected because of that awareness. Your uh, Your thoughts, your mind is already deflecting that. And so the magic isn't working. What that jinn is trying to do to divide husband and wife isn't going to work. Um, they're going to have to use other uh, ways. Jana, during our conversation, you repeatedly mentioned connection with some forces. If it's not a secret, what was your contract about? I mean, what do you pay with for possessing this power? 
this mustn't be disclosed. So magicians have a contract, right? They sell themselves and they sell, selling themselves, selling their soul, you can say, um, is what? Selling their souls is uh, the contract. And the Quran mentions this specifically, right? In fact, uh, just because we're here, I'll go ahead and show you specifically where Quran actually mentions this. This idea of selling your soul is not just something in a Hollywood movie, but is actually, uh, you'll see this, it's mentioned in the Quran. Now, the contract is a two-way contract, right? Like, we'll give you this if you do this. But uh, usually it's a lot more terrifying than that. If I had time, I would explain it. But let me just uh, show you this verse of the Quran. I just want to talk about the last part of that. وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنْ اشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ And they knew. وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا They were told. لَمَنْ اشْتَرَاهُ Whoever buys this, whoever makes a contract, right? Whoever deals with this magic. اشْتَرَى يَشْتَرِي Literally means to buy. Okay? وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنْ اشْتَرَاهُ And buying is a contract, right? So whoever buys this. And it's very, it's even a more appropriate word, the one in Quran, in contract, in a sense that a contract could be one way, meaning uh, if I, I'll give you this, and it's one way contract, but ishtara is two ways. I'll give you this if you give me this, right? So the contract that she's talking about is actually an ishtara. You could say it's something that you buy one for the other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنْ اشْتَرَاهُ And they already knew that whoever purchased, who purchased this, one for the other, exchanged this, مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ He has no portion in the hereafter. وَلَبِعْسَ مَا شَرَوْ بِهِ أَنفُسَهُمْ And what did they sell? What an evil thing is that they sold themselves for. What a miserable price they sold themselves for. وَلَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ If they only did but know. So this is, what we call the contract. But each magic you do has a contract. Each time a magician does a magic, each time a magician does magic, it's like he's putting his soul into that magic. And that magic then goes into that other person through the jinn, okay, or, or other means, but usually through the magic or through food or whatever, that magic goes into that other person. If you break the magic, you break the contract. If you break the contract, you destroy a piece of that person's soul. Not in the sense of the ruh, but in, in the sense of the person. Okay, He's losing his fitrah. He's losing his himself. And so he has no portion in the hereafter because he's put him in a position where he's going to completely lose uh, all his humanity. That's one aspect of it. Okay, So this contract is a very important concept. Uh, within the world of magic. What I paid off to this force is forbidden to talk about. But I can say that a person who concluded a contract, <coughs> if we are speaking of dark forces, and who knows what he will pay with, by calling this force, he does crap through it and brings necessary energy into this egregore. I mean, it's also an egregore, only it feeds on a different energy. The more crap I do, the more people I involve. You know, it's like bring a friend and you'll get a bonus. It works in this case. The more people renounce the cross because of me and turn away from the church, the more energy I bring into that egregore, the more it will give me. But in the end, yes, I will pay something. Yet while doing these evil deeds, I take money from people. They eventually leave with a result. I have their money and this egregore gets a portion of crap from me, which I have done to somebody. That's the chain. Did you know that at the time of concluding the contract? Not exactly. But you stipulated in advance what would you pay with, didn't you? Well, let's say I was deceived. That is why I'll repeat again, when people unknowingly get into it, it always ends badly. And there is nothing you can do about that? Not anymore. I've already paid. So this is where she's wrong. Shaitan convinces a person that once you've sold yourself, you've sold your soul, that's it, that's the end. You, you've, you know, your, your soul, your, your fate is sealed. What you need to tell the magician, like the magicians of Musa, is that no, you didn't, you can just decide to leave. There's nothing they can do. You're a human being, right? But they convince these people and these magicians that, or oh, you're stuck. 
That's the first point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make was that she talked about how she's stopping people from going to the churches. Why? Well, there are many reasons why Shaitan is doing this. But one of the reasons that she's stopping people from going to the church is because Christianity is what was used to attack all religions. And if you could make Christianity go down, that automatically makes all the religions go down. It's much harder to attack Islam directly, as she mentioned. So what the other option is, is for the middle level magicians like her that are not really high, is that they attack the average Christians from going to the church. So they bring down the global uh, strength of the religious way of life. And they attack Muslims in other ways. Okay. So now just listen to what she's saying again, just that part. Uh oh. Lead feeds on a different energy. Oh, this is a very important point. Shayateen feed off of your fears, out of your depression. They feed off of, uh, like if you're saying bad things or good things, they're feeding off of your energy, basically, okay? They feed off of your energy. The more crap I do, the more people I involve. You know, it's like bring a friend and you'll get a bonus. It works in this case. The more people renounce the cross because of me and turn away from the church, the more energy I bring into that egregore, the more it will give me. But in the end, yes, I will pay something. Yet while doing these evil deeds, I take money from people. They eventually leave with the result. I have their money and this egregore gets a portion of crap from me, which I have done to somebody. That's the chain. Did you know that at the time of concluding the contract? Not exactly. But you stipulated in advance what would you pay with, didn't you? Well, let's say I was deceived. That is why I'll repeat again. When people unknowingly get into it, it always ends badly. And there is nothing you can do about that? Not anymore. I've already paid. So all the conditions have been fulfilled? I've paid in full, so to say. That's the only reason I left this egregore, because I lost everything the most precious I had. Payment due came at the moment when I began to renounce it. Since you quit, go ahead and pay. She was told that your parents died, your relatives died because you were stepping back from it. So you can't step back from it. Whereas, you know, death happens when it happens. But this is how Shaitan manipulates people. Is it actually scary to live? To live? Well, how to put it, it depends on what you're afraid of. So much around. Speaking about practice, I can say that when I buried my entire family, life became much easier. In the sense that there is nothing I can be afraid of losing. As a rule, people are afraid to live if they are not completely selfish. They are worried about their relatives and friends. They are afraid of losing what is most precious. That is probably the fear of a normal person who really loves someone and feels something. When you have nothing to lose, this fear disappears and you already realize that you are alone. One-on-one -on -one with yourself and, in fact, you've already passed the threshold of fear, which could be worse for you. To a certain extent, the absence of fear gives you strength. You stop being afraid of living, dying, and so on. Jana, what advice would you give to our viewers who might be afraid of some impact of the invisible world? Well, and just to people who would like to live happily in well-being and peace of mind and so on. I wish such people not to break the balance. If you want others to do you good, don't do crap to others either. Because as a rule, there is no boomerang, there is balance. Think positively, because often people start telling themselves, I cannot do that, I won't make it, this is my destiny. No, you should think positively, you should attract good things into your life with your intention. Raise your vibrations, go in for sports, spend more time in nature, energize your life in every way. Don't live like in a Groundhog Day. You come home from work, eat, hang out somewhere on the weekend and go back to work. You should develop, read, educate yourself, develop spiritually, maintain your physical shape. I mean all this together. I can advise people to just take care of themselves, of their life and bring only the best into it. Jana, thank you so much for coming to our studio. It's been a big pleasure talking to you. For me, it's also a great pleasure visiting you. I hope I answered some of the questions. Thank you. Now, one Your part where uh, she mentioned something let's see if i can get it again it's very important and uh, i wanted to comment about it i will let you listen to from here again just a little bit because i want to comment on something she said that's extremely important this is the part where she starts talking about how it's hard to do magic on muslims it's thoughts and purity yes absolutely when faced with various religions it is very difficult to influence muslims they are in a constant connection with the aggregor. They do namaz every day and read prayers on a daily basis. They are constantly under some kind of a dome, so it is very difficult to influence them. 
When you start impacting a person, he begins to address in a prayer. Indeed, many of them are very different from those who come to church only when everything is bad in their life. They come to pray, and then for five years they forget about God, some canons, and so on. Muslims, as a rule, passionately believe and passionately give energy to their egregore, and this egregore protects them very well. That's why it is very difficult to work to make any kind of influence on a true Muslim believer. Is this some kind of a good egregore? Well, for them, yes. This egregore is good for adepts who contribute good energy to it. How do you sense it? For instance, you have found an energy trace of such person. What's next? Do you try to drag him somehow to visualize this? What she was saying about addicts, what she meant is, if somebody is an add addict, let's say an alcohol, right? And then uh, this person that's an alcoholic is all of a sudden spending time with This person is all of a sudden spending time with Muslims. What will happen? He's surrounded by good energy. So the person who is an addict of alcoholics happens when people become Muslim. It's so easy for them to leave because they're now around a positive environment. And so then they leave alcohol. So this is uh, one thing that she's, she said that I didn't comment on last time. And the other thing, oh, I do want to talk about and what is an aggregate. I'll talk about that in a second threat and you fail or how do you do that it disappears i cannot get a grip on it i focus on it but some okay, so this is the part that i wanted to talk about is that when she does magic she does a type of what we call a uh, uh, she concentrates on someone she has a picture she has a voice recording whatever she is she's she uh is trying to connect to somebody okay and when she's part of that is when but if somebody ha is pious or has protection, uh, is reading Quran, is doing adhkar. When these people, let's say she's sitting in Ukraine trying to do magic on me, what will happen? As soon as she is focusing on me, there will be no image. It's like there's a protection around the person. You can't see the person. Okay. So, for example, just as an example, uh, you know, like I've had jinns say to me several times, uh, that I can't see you, I can't see you, I can't see, where are you, like, I can't see you. So the jinns will say things like that when there's a certain protection around a person. Okay, so now, uh, yes, let me now share with you uh, something a little bit different. Um, uh, I wanted to share with you what she means by uh let's see if i have it here yes here okay she's talking about the aggregor okay uh it, it it's an occult word okay representing a non-physical entity so there's a non-physical protection around you okay that arises from the collective thoughts of a distinct group of people so uh you're having thoughts those thoughts, your adhkar, your prayers, they create a non-physical entity around you. That is what is meant by, um, that's what's meant by egregore, okay? So uh, a lot of times, jinns will come near a certain person and there is a some sort of, you can use the word egregore or they have a protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happens? The jinn begins to burn just by get, being near that person. So that's the 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 aura around that person. The you could say the protection around that person, and so that's what a lot of the athkar. That's what they do when you say, for example, three times after Fajr or after Maghrib or Bismillah. If you say these and other many other duas, they give you a type of any any dua. In fact, for any prayers, they'll give you a type of protection. But some are specifically for like protection against the shayateen and so on and so forth. Now we're going to watch um, a, a little bit more simple video, but it will require a little bit more explanation. Um, Ayatul Kursi, of course, Ayatul Kursi, yes. Especially if it's done with the intention of this type of protection. Okay, So we're going to listen to this uh, magician or uh, wizard. Uh, even though he's in suit and tie. And, uh, but you know, that's how everyone is nowadays. So even magicians, they wear suit and tie or wizards. Okay. <clears throat> Bismillah.
So let's see what this person says. He's going to talk about some of the mechanisms that I want to share with you. And then I want to end up talking about how does this all relate to our last video that we did in which we talked about um, the gut, the parasites, and sickness, and gins, and how does all of this relate to one another? And the, the short answer, it relates to one another because of the changing of the energy level. When you change the person's energy level, their, their lifestyle changes. When their lifestyle changes, what they eat changes. When they eat changes, affects the sickness. So it's like a whole cycle, okay? So the first thing that changes that they try to do is to change your thoughts from positive to negative. They change your mood, your energy level. Your energy level changes your lifestyle. Your lifestyle creates or attracts sickness. So this is kind of like how this relates to the last video. Okay, now let's listen to what this person is going to say. There's such a problem that from time to time, <clears throat> in case of some viewers, quite often, invisible creatures come to you at night, which in demonology are katsukubai and inkubai. Or if we put it simply, shadows. These shadows exert physical and energy influence. They often inflict all sorts of nightmares on people and can have sexual intercourse with them. Thereafter, people complain that they feel exhausted, have no strength, get into various depressive states, and lose energy. Moreover, they have sleep disorders and lose the joy of life. So when you're doing Rokia, it's very important and I think almost if I'm doing Rukia or if I meet somebody who needs help, one of the first questions I will always ask, like it's like my sunnah to ask in this case, how their sleep is. Or do you have nightmares? Do you wake up every night at the same time for no reason? You know, do you feel tired when you wake up for no reason? Um, you know, do you feel that there's some ants on your legs? These are like typical questions I'll ask. Um, in, in almost every instance. Generally speaking, quite serious interchanges take place, which greatly affect the quality of life. Recently, we began to receive more of such letters. We don't know for sure why. Perhaps this is due to the COVID epidemic that has provoked numerous fears among people. It is quite possible that on the wave of this fear, the activity of shadows has increased as well. What he's saying is, because of the pandemic, the activity of the shayateen has increased. Why? Well, one way to explain it, based upon today's lesson, is that when you're in a pandemic, okay, there's a collective uh, state of fear. And then also what's happening, you're not about, you're not doing positive things, you're at home, domestic violence increases, your arguments with your wife increase, negativity comes in more, loved ones don't meet each other anymore, people not going to the masjid for two years in a row. When negativity comes in, food for the shayateen comes in. They feed off of this, right? <clears throat> okay, so they feed off of this. And what happens? The activity of the shaytan increases. So uh, so now let's listen to what he's saying again, specifically how it relates to the pandemic. Recently, we began to receive more of such letters. We don't know for sure why. Perhaps this is due to the COVID epidemic that has provoked numerous fears among people. It is quite possible that on the wave of this fear, the activity of shadows has increased as well. Shadow means jinn. That's the reason why we decided to initiate this project and find answers to relevant questions. What is this in... Don't go to these people for answers. This is just another trick 
but I'm using them to explain things to you since it's coming directly from the voices of the magicians themselves. Fact. How can people protect themselves from it? Is it possible to control these shadows? So, we decided to study this subject. This subject isn't new. It is rather widespread in the demonology of various cultures, nations and religions. Let's begin with the point that these creatures are distinguished by gender. Incubi are creatures that assume a masculine image. In Latin, the word incubus... These people really don't know what they're talking about, but just listen to what they're saying and I'm going to point out the important parts. ...means to lie upon. A succubus is a creature that assumes a feminine image, and this name is translated from Latin as to lie underneath. What are the characteristics of these creatures? As you know, sleep is one of the times where shaitan attacks a human being because he's more vulnerable at that time. And he's in a dreamlike state, which they have more access to. And then he's going to make some very good points about this particular state of sleep. These creatures are characterized by the fact that they connect to a person's consciousness while he is falling asleep. That is this is a very important point. Shaitan attaches himself to your consciousness at the moment you're about to sleep, just like we do our afkab specifically for when, for when we're about to sleep, right? So as you're about to go into sleep and you're remembering Allah, you're doing your afkar or you fall asleep during your tasbihat, that's a good thing. Shait there will be a protection around you, that he won't be able to attach himself to your consciousness. It is in the phase of drowsy. A person isn't awake anymore, but he isn't asleep either, and he hasn't yet fallen into deep sleep. Precisely during this period, these creatures have an opportunity to connect to a person's consciousness and impose certain illusions on him. These illusions may be of various kinds depending, let's say, on the psychological state of a person. As a rule, these creatures influence two basic instincts of the animal nature, of a human, fear of body, death, and sexual fantasy or desire. In fact, they influence a person's desire. Why? Because fear is the reverse side of desire. Fear is, well, with sexual desires, everything is clear. I want, I'm interested in something, but when fear arises in a person, the desire is opposite. I don't want, meaning, I don't want something to happen. So at the moment, when a person experiences strong emotions, either fear or sexual desire... Or sadness. He didn't mention sadness, but sadness is also one of them. Fear, sadness, sexual desire could be one. Anger could be another one. So those are moments those those where there's a shift of energy, when there's a shift in your energy states is when you're vulnerable. Or sexual contact. At that moment, a huge release of human vital energy occurs, which is actually devoured by this creature. These creatures have quite developed intelligence, like pick locks to a keyhole. They easily pick up those images which the internal protection system of a human lets slip through. These may be images of acquaintances or ex-girlfriends, if it concerns men, or boyfriends whom a girl was dating, or images of some idols towards whom a person has sexual fantasies. With pinpoint precision, these creatures are able to connect to human consciousness and detect images that his psyche and consciousness lets in. In other words, consciousness perceives the scenario as normal for itself. Interestingly, the works of medieval scientists, as well as eyewitness reports, and your letters prove this, describe situations 
when people can often have sexual intercourse with images that are quite unnatural. They note that in their usual normal state, meaning what he's saying is when the shaitan takes a person, attaches himself to a person's consciousness, let's say they're going to sleep, then a certain image comes to you. And if you have intimacy, that image that you're having intimacy with could be something very ugly, right? Something that you wouldn't even think about, like I would want to have intimacy with. So that's what he's talking about. They wouldn't want to have sexual intercourse with them. Moreover, they would be scared even to look at them. However, demons in the Middle Ages, they were called sleep demons and are able to skillfully build a reality, even a certain surrealism, which is unnatural for normal logic. Yet, in dreams, it all seems natural and normal. Thus, they bypass the defense mechanism of a human and connect to him as a result of such a connection. Meaning when you're awake, you have your morality, you have your filters that we were talking about earlier. Like if you have a thought, cheat on your wife, you'll be like, no, I never cheat on my wife, right? But those, a lot of those filters are not really functioning in their normal way when you're asleep. And so if shaitan attaches, let's say somebody went to sleep, right? So this is very normal. This is not about magic. This is just about a normal interaction with shaitan. Um, you're going to sleep. You're really tired. You didn't say your adhka. Now you went to sleep. As you're going to sleep, when you're in that drowsy state, when you're not really asleep yet, but you're not, you're not completely awake yet, in that drowsy state, shaitan attaches himself to you. Now you went to sleep. Now shaitan can play with your mind because he's part of your consciousness. So now, um, and so they will come to your mind in to, to change your energy level, right? To create fear, to create anxiety, uh, to mess you up so that when you wake up, you're not feeling energetic, you're not feeling normal, right? So first they try to do insomnia. If insomnia doesn't work, then at least when they're going to sleep, will change their energy around. So that when they wake up, they're not, you know, they might be a little bit more on the edge, so on and so forth. Okay, so. A person loses a huge amount of power and energy and feels exhausted in the morning. Creatures such as incubi have another distinctive way of affecting a person, a physical one. It means that they can sit on top of a person on his or her chest, immobilize him or her. I've had many, 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 hundreds, hundreds of people tell me that, you know, I was sleeping and I woke up and I felt like this thing on top of me or different scenarios of the same thing experienced in different ways, or I felt heaviness on top of me, or I felt uh, in my dream, I felt something on top of me on my chest. Or sometimes I'll hear people talk about behind their neck like this. Or they can press him or her down, right? Yes, that's right. They press and immobilize a person. Often a person himself detects it. Thus he understands that he's immobilized and he is terrified. This happens when you are trying to wake up and you can't, or you can't move, or you can't scream, you can't say. You know then at that time when you wake up and you finally wake up and you realize what? Oh, okay, so I probably must have not said my adhkar before I went to sleep. That's why this happened. Um, and you'll realize that that will be true, that you didn't say your azkar, and they were able to attach themselves to you. And now they're, they're in control of you to the point that you want to wake up or you feel like you're up, but you can't even talk. You can't, it's hard to do azkar. So you have to fight them off. And that's another subject of what to do in a situation like that. A jinn actually puts themselves in a very vulnerable situation because once they're attached to you, you can actually kill them very easily if you're aware of what's going on terrified of what is happening. He can't even scream, move, or make a sound. This influence is so strong, so powerful, that a person really feels inner panic, fear. Yes. And he doesn't understand exactly what to do. Yes, absolutely right. It's also typical for them to lift a person into the air or get him out of bed. There were cases of death when such an invisible creature could, the interaction with them could lead to a fatal outcome.
These creatures can generally be called shadows. Why shadows? Because the form that such creatures assume in order to engage with a person changes easily. A creature itself is genderless. It just takes a convenient form and creates such a situation which is necessary for a person to emote. If we put it simply, again, the two main emotions through which they work, as we have already mentioned today, are the fear of body death and a strong sexual desire. They arrange everything in order to take away vital energy from a person. Regarding the fact that demons have only one goal, to eat. Also, let's add that they are able to kill a person. They are able to take a person's life. But that's what they do very rarely. Why? Because a human is like a dairy cow for them. So, basically, a creature comes, milks and leaves. It comes, eats energy and leaves. That's why they don't kill a person. Although killing... And don't think of that as a big deal, because that's exactly what we are for bacteria and parasites. I mean, they milk us like we milk a cow. So it's normal. You, know, yeah, you read your Quran, you keep positive thoughts, you keep a positive lifestyle. It's harder for them to act on you. But if you let down your guard, you don't have morality, you don't have a strong filter, um, you're depressed and fearful of everything around you, well, their activity around you will increase because you're a better cow to milk for them now. You'll give them the negative energy that they need. Killing a person is not a problem for them. As for killing people by these creatures, it often happens as described in demonology. When a person shuts down and, let's say, doesn't want to get involved in a relationship with a demon, Regarding historical facts and what has been happening for thousands of years, this topic has existed for thousands of years. When we studied it, we were surprised that the attitude to such an unnatural love in society was different at different times. Religions have always talked about the danger of this phenomenon. But from the moment when spiritual, moral, and ethical values deteriorated in society, as in the era of Hellenism and the height of the Roman Empire, when there was a flourishing cult of the body, there was a significant number of poets and composers who praised the so-called incubate and succubate in their works. This demonic love, right? Yes, absolutely right. They praised it in such a way that it's all very beautiful. Great. It's the most beautiful love that can be. But if we look at it from the perspective of modern sociology, we can say that in ancient times, as well as today, the Overton windows have been used. I mean, what is unacceptable, which has an extremely negative assessment in society. What all religions talk about such demonic relations bring one's soul down to hell. People of art, on the contrary, gave positive color. This naturally had an extremely negative impact on society itself. <coughs> Even in the church. Uh, let me explain what he's saying uh, from a, a different author uh, who's, I might do a video on that at some point, but when society reaches a point of production, so you have the pioneers, then you have the production, and then once a society reaches a high point, it gets into art, right? And entertainment and, and culture and this person's art and this person's art, that phase, uh, and, and I'll mention this as part of this, is that that phase of human history is where you start to do more satanic things and you start, uh, because people get used to luxuries and then they also get into art and what's interesting is you know how you're not allowed to eat from your left hand unless of course you are left-handed that might be an exception which i'm not going to talk about that right now even though the better opinion is that if you're left-handed you can do everything you want with left hand but specifically don't eat with your left hand uh but I, let's not go into the fiqh aspects right now uh, the legal aspects right so generally, if you're left-handed, then what happens? The left hand uh, relates more with, um, and, and I'll, I'll actually show this to you right now, just so you get an idea. And maybe Dr. Imtiaz or somebody can shed more light on this. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, let me sh uh, share this with you. Um, and then this you'll find interesting, inshallah. Um, left-handedness and also what uh left-handed and uh mental illness okay uh left-handed people are more likely to have mental disorders 
So there's something about that part of the brain. Now, uh, the um, left sided, uh, you could say the uh, uh, okay. The effect of right brain, left brain on art. What I'm trying to say here is that. Uh, Let me see if I can show it to you. Maybe I'll leave it for now. But there's definitely something about the left hand and the left side versus the right side. The right side is the good side. The left hand, you know, Ashab al Yamini, Ashab al Shimal, is how this relates to that side of the brain that has to do with creativity, right? Um, that side of the brain that has to do with art, that side of the brain that has to do with music is more prone to sig shaitan's suggestions than the other side, okay? So that was the link I was trying to make. Many monks said in confessions that they cohabited with such creatures and couldn't get rid of it themselves. Yet, let's say, if you are unable to get rid of it yourself, how can you help others? Since we have touched upon religion, I'd like to add a little about Islam too. This problem was and is still present among Muslims. Just like in Christianity, there are rites of exorcism in Islam, when a mullah is reading ayat from the Quran upon a person. He supposedly exercises, in Islam it is called genies, shaitans, like a shaitan is possessed a person. And this way, a mullah holds a person, sometimes even spits on him and reads ayat from the Quran. It looks a bit strange, let's say, and of course it doesn't solve the problem. Now, we've touched on this point a little that psychiatry and religion try to help a person. But at the same time, there is no real help. Thus, people have been alone with this problem and still are. The most interesting thing is that, as it was written before, and eyewitnesses say it now, it's very easy to call it up. It's very easy. It's enough to wish for it, and you get a response at once. But it is very difficult to get rid of it. Yes, and it's a huge problem because, again, according to the descriptions of theologians and people who could talk openly about it. People were suffering for years and decades trying to get rid of those manifestations. There are two ways to get rid of these kinds of demons. The first way is to appeal to stronger demons, which always requires a certain price to pay from a person. I mean, it's just impossible in the material world that you ask demons to do something and they just did it for free. A person will definitely pay, for sure, either with circumstances or with his health. There will definitely be some loss. And the second way to get rid of this power of a demon over a person was when non-demonic forces came to help him. They appeared as an image that is familiar to human consciousness. Thus, if a person belongs to the Christian religion, the image of saints, Jesus Christ or Mother of God appeared. If a person belonged to the Islamic faith, this help came from the image of those very saints, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the image of Ali. This, by the way, everything he said about the Quran doesn't work, but these other images of other saints' works, this is all a sham. And I, I think everybody here that's listening to this would already know that, but I'm saying that just in case that's not clear. Um, and this you can contrast with the other lady that we first saw, who clearly said, in contradiction to what these people said, uh, that uh, it's very hard to affect a Muslim uh, with magic. Uh, yes, of course, there are. Uh, they're right in the sense that you do a lot of rukia on someone, you do a lot of reading of Quran on someone, it doesn't take away their problem. But there are other reasons for that. The most basic answer to that is that the Prophet also told us that this is what? This is part of Allah's test and part of your nasib and part of your taqdeer. For example, Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, he got touched by shaitan. In Namasaniya Shaitan, oh Allah, Shaitan has touched me, but only touch. So there are some people they get affected by Shaitan, but Shaitan is there as a way to bring them closer to Allah and as a way for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up a way for them to go to Jannah. And it's in their nasib to be affected by uh, the Shaitan. But Shaitan 
only touches them, meaning it, it affects them, but it doesn't affect them to the point where um, somebody that's overwhelmed by shaitan who is doing sin. So there's a certain touch, but not being yet the habbatahu shaitanum al mas. For example, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about people who devour interest, right? They put themselves in a situation where shaitan can beat them up, right? With And so that again, interest brings in negative energy. One of the ways it brings in negative energy is you know you have to pay debt after month after month for years and years. That brings a certain stress to certain people. And that opens up all that negativity for a person to be affected by the world of shaitan. But everything he just said right now is just a, a hogwash. It's a baloney. It, it's a sham. It has no... Um... However, we won't touch upon this topic so far. It's a very interesting topic, but, <laughs> but it is still poorly studied. Regarding the point that there is nothing good in all that, in this regard I'd like to tell a story that I read on the forum. By the way, there are many forums on this topic, where people share how demons, incubi, succubi, appear in their lives and how they actually live with all these. Of course, among these stories they are obviously fictional, but nonetheless, true ones are also found. You read and understand that this is really the experience of a specific person. I want to briefly tell one of such stories. So I'm not going to go into his stories right now, and I think we've done enough of this for now. Uh, okay. So what's the main lesson that we get out from today's uh, conversation? And then after that, we'll take maybe one or two questions. And the main lesson is that when you are doing your adhkar, when you're doing your salah, when you're doing your reading of Quran, when you're doing these things, it creates a protection around you. How shaitan attaches himself to a person, especially during sleep. What is shape? How does shaitan manipulate people by changing energy levels, by bringing negative thoughts, leading to negative lifestyles, leading to sickness? Right? Negative thoughts lead to bad marriage. Um, uh, and so, uh, negative thoughts. If the wife has negative thoughts, the husband has negative thoughts. They'll be fighting with each other because they'll be assuming negative things. All the, instead of looking at the positive, they'll be looking at the negative. And this is affecting many, many couples in, in the times that we live in, is that uh, for many reasons, but that's, that's just a fact, is that uh, shaitan is playing his role, big role now. In, 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 but this is a very important point, is that when divorce rates go high, what does that show you? That shows negative energy is high, which shows shaitan's, Activity is high, right? So all these things uh, relate to one another. And so shaitan is able to manipulate your energy level, your energy levels, your diet changes, your lifestyle changes, your negative thoughts increase. This is what shaitan does. So what is the answer to, what's the anecdote for that? The anecdote isn't like the person said in a sense. It's not just any more reading Quran. It is now, it has to start at a very, very basic level. You have to change your psyche. You have to change. You have to start with your negative thoughts. You have to start with the whispers of shaitan. You have to start with making sure you're eating good food. You have to start with, this is relating to my last lecture. You have to make sure that when you're going to sleep, you're doing your adhkar. This will create, will not allow negativity to seep in. What, would, what will happen if negativity is not seeping into your life? Well, you'll be more positive. You'll have more positive relationships. You have more positive attitude towards your wife or towards your husband. You have more positive attitude towards everyone. You're not as annoyed when somebody does something annoying, right? You're, you have more emotional, uh, you could say, strength. Um, you're more emotionally intelligent. All these things are interrelated. And so the way, and this is probably the most important thing for us to understand, is it starts with the positive or negative high and low level of energies you give yourself. Quran is a very high level of energy, right? But even reading Quran is, is not going to be as effective if that energy is not being absorbed into you. Because if, if you're all negative thoughts, 
And you're like, oh, Allah never does what I want. And Allah never gives me shifa. And Allah never gives me money. But I'm going to read Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. That's not going to work in the same way. You have to be in a positive state. And then you're reading Quran. You have to be, so it has to start with your intention, your iman, your nur in your heart, your thoughts, and the lifestyle, and the positive thinking. You know, this is why Allah says, in, in ismun, don't think negative, don't have even wrong, some negative thoughts are a sin, because it's just shaitanic, and don't spy, because when you have negative thoughts about someone, then you want to verify those negative thoughts, you start spying. So Allah says, don't even spy. Don't even go there. Like, don't even go into that world. Don't backbite other people. Don't live in that negative energy. Because all that will do is will give shaitan control over you because your, your energy level becomes negative. And so that is, and, and that energy level, as it changes, your diet changes, right? So you want to come, what happens when people don't feel good? They change their diet. They eat more or they eat less. They change, you know, people like, I feel really bad. I feel really upset. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go have a bunch of ice cream. I'm just giving it as an example, you know? So some people will like binge on something that uh, will make them feel good, right? People eat more when they're not feeling good or they eat less when they're not feeling good. So it's all a domino effect. Uh, starting with the mind to even how you're breathing to your your positive thoughts negative thoughts to how they affect your diet how they affect your relationship and shaitan is just an entity that can get attached to your consciousness or throw thoughts into your consciousness negative thoughts right shaitan's not going to throw positive thoughts it's the negative thoughts coming into you so you have to become aware of that and you have to fight off those thoughts from the very moment that they begin to come into you. So they can be thoughts of sin. They can be thoughts of uh, a negative idea towards your wife. They can be all any of these, right? And all these things are interrelated with your health, your well-being, I guess is a good word, your well-being, overall, your holistic well-being. It's all interrelated. So you you're, you're don't have to cure a person only using Quran. You can also cure them by telling them to have a good diet. You can also cure them by teaching them how to have positive attitude. Uh, you can also cure them in many different ways, depending upon what shaitan is doing. So I will open myself up now for question answers. Maybe we'll take two, three questions and call it a day, inshallah. Um, let me see. Have light in your house, natural light. Yes, yes, that's a good point. See lots of nature, either real or pictures, and keep physically smiling. Mashallah, those are good points. I would like uh, Dr. Imtiaz, if he's available, to maybe um, comment on what we talked about today. <clears throat> Wa can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, alhamdulillah. I hope you're doing well. I, I'm doing well, and I hope you, inshallah, you're doing well. Alhamdulillah. And, um, Sheikh, uh, really thank you very much for the nice uh, uh, class today. Learned lots of new things. But, um, you know, like uh, regarding this negative emotion and you know, the shayatin gene attaching to person, you know, like uh, we have seen this with uh, several patients, like uh, most of the cancer patient, you know, mm. uh, there are point uh, like, uh, like yeah, they are under treatment and you know, they come to a point where they don't get cured anymore. Like it does, the treatment doesn't work at all. So that from that point, you know, they are advised to um, you know, relieve themselves of any kind of uh, emotion, negative emotion. That's what I believe because since uh, cancer is a gene poison, I mm. believe like we believe that like when you let go of those negative emotion, you stop feeding the gene and maybe that's, how, that's why they leave you and go. Mm. That, that's why they, they leave the patients and go and they start healing themselves. This is what I have seen. So you're There's saying a, that uh, cancer patients, a lot of times they are uh, 
thrown into a lot of negative thoughts and they have to work. Yes. And that will be less. Yes, yes. So, he, a cancer patient cannot, cannot be a cancer patient until, until and unless they have negative thoughts. They are 100% they must have done, done something uh, seriously bad in their life. Some negative thought is there, negativity is there in their life. Hmm. So you have to get that, uh, get rid of that negativity, then you will be able to care or, uh, cure or heal, heal yourself. Oh, there's no chance. Because there are uh, scientists, they have already done research from you know, like, uh, lots of European German scientists. You know, their website also, they have uh, you know, named this as emotional freedom techniques. Hmm. So, uh, I think there are certain verses in Quran also, I can't remember that, but there are, these things are uh, like uh, helpful. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, that's okay. That makes sense. Uh, anything else you want to add, Dr. Imtiaz? Uh, today, actually, I'm a bit uh, I'm tired, so you know, maybe we'll just okay, talk later. Okay, okay. Shalala, no problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to make any comments or questions? Sheikh, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi yeah, one of the things that I, I found interesting, I just wondered if this is one of the things that deals with it or not, is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allah loves those who pray on time. Mm -hmm. And going back to their things about the energy, and I just try, I don't know if it's real or not, but I wondered if that was a connection between the, there's more energy when you pray on time, then the, does the energy decrease? Is it is that an option or is it just? Yeah, nothing? I mean, from the moment you start doing wudu, your energy levels will increase. From the moment you start, uh, you know, doing wadu and doing your wadu properly, and uh, and if it's a male walking to the masjid, or uh, if you start praying, it will definitely increase your positivity. And uh, you know, let's say even if you're... Other thing because Allah says He loves those who pray on time, and I thought that yeah, was interesting. Then... The connection you thought maybe yeah. there's a. One definite there? connection with praying on time is this, is that there's a sense of self-control. Mm. When you, uh, when you, because human beings like to feel that they're in control. One of the things that happens with, for example, cigarettes is a person wants to let go of cigarettes, but can't, right? And that at a very deep level affects us and it brings in a certain negative attitude even regarding ourselves there's a certain blame and shame that comes with not letting being able to get let go of something that is addictive like smoking when you are able to do something uh like praying on time it gives you a sense of accomplishment it gives you a sense of control and so that brings in certain positivity and there may be mother, other, many other, many, many other aspects, but for specifically from the perspective of energy, one of the aspects of praying on time is that it gives you an internal sense of control, right? And of course, if the person is praying and then they're stressed, then they're doing dua, and then that affects that. Now, does, let's say, Praying in certain times. So we have to pray five times a day, praying in Fajr or praying at Isha. Does that timing also play a role with uh, the energy levels? I think so. So, for example, when the sunlight is not there, meaning it's daytime, we pray our prayers silently, Dhuhr and Asr, right? When there's some darkness, we pray our prayers more loudly, at least for the men. And so <clears throat> it seems like that there's something to the night and the day and the type of recitation and all of that, of course, then relates to the, the level of energy needed at that time. Okay. Any other questions? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum. So um, I have a question with regards to uh, becoming acquainted with the Quran, 
So I think one of the best ways to uh, protect ourselves is to recite the Quran every month or at least every day. So I try, I try to read the Quran every month, especially the Jews' Khatams. So I did Surah Baqarah, Surah, you know, um, Surah Imran, Surah Nisa. But then what happens is after like four or five days later, I will miss a day. And then I end up falling off. And it happens like um, like two or three times so far. So I haven't been able to finish the Quran um, in one month yet. Do you have any tips to, on that? To yeah, continue? that is that if you skip a day for whatever reason, mm -hmm. skip that portion of that day. And just do the portion you're supposed to do for that day. Meaning okay. if I didn't read Quran yesterday and I and then today I'm supposed to read uh, whatever surahs I'm supposed to read today. I'll read those surahs, not not try to go back. Okay, okay, because so, I I will try to go back and try to finish the juz before. Yeah, and then you do yeah, that, it's going it to adds up, gonna overwhelm you in the beginning, especially if you're not used to it. So what you should do is yeah, on day one to day twenty nine, these the surahs, and if you follow uh, uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein's uh, the Quran mm -hmm. in the Moon uh, procedure. Uh, that makes the reading of the Quran throughout the month very easy because uh, the, the reading of Quran is only long one day, which is Fatiha and Baqarah. Then after that, it's less almost each day after that. Thank you. Any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Uh, Shaykh, I have a question. If someone is in the habit of seeing raisins, why... I can't hear. Your as alaikum was fine. I was able to hear. But I can't hear after, the, after that. Okay. Is my voice clear? Yes, much clear. Yes. Okay, I was asking that if someone is in the habit of seeing visions uh, while uh, while doing uh, a scar or uh, uh, you can say while while reading uh, salawat, durood. Uh, so, okay. are these visions also connected with your energies? What are these visions? I mean, are these in? Is there a connection with some? type of energies are these uh, uh, positive energies or negative energies so that you will have to determine but i'm going to give you a just if so just as you get used to determining what are not your thoughts and what are your thoughts then there are other levels so you also get to determine over time which are the negative thoughts from shape on and which are maybe positive ideas or something positive came to you from, let's say, an angel or a type of kashf, you could say. Some idea Allah put in your heart. Or we call it kashf or alqa, something like this. Anyway, the point being that if those images and thoughts become your center of focus outside dhikr, so you're doing dhikr, or you're doing durood, or you're reading Quran, and you have some thought, now you're thinking of that thought and you're not thinking of Quran, then that can be positive or negative. You have to see what is the content. You have to think about it. This is why you can never be sure. Imam Ghazali, he says that the only thoughts you know that are your thoughts are the ones where you started the thinking process. For example, um, let's say I think to myself, uh, I'm hungry. So my body tells me I'm hungry. And then I'm thinking, okay, let me go ahead and make myself eggs. Now that is me thinking because something happened and because something external happened or something inside me happened. And I'm thinking about, and I'm thinking about it from beginning to end. So that's a chain of thoughts that are interconnected because of something that's relevant in my life. The other type of thought is a random thought. It's something that just came from, it's not, it's not, uh, it's a random thought. It didn't come because of any reason. Those thoughts that come to us and we don't know the reason why that thought came. So you have a thought and you're thinking to yourself, okay, why did this thought come to my mind? 
those thoughts that you have no reason to say why it came to you are either going to be from shaitan or something else or just could be random thoughts but uh, there's uh, there's a question here is that our random thoughts in other words if somebody is in sakina sukun he's in nafsul mutma'inna does that person have just random thoughts or is that person in a state of sakina so the answer is the more the noise in your mind the less sakina a person has so a person should not be should not be having random running thoughts in their mind if they're in a state of sakina okay so random thoughts are either going to be from shaitan or sometimes they can be from sometimes it could be a good thing and most of the time it will be a bad thing so you have to determine uh are these thoughts helping you focus more on dhikr or less number 1 number 2 is the content good or bad meaning you're doing dhikr and you're getting an idea oh that person's going to hurt you or you're thinking you're doing dhikr and you have a thought uh, some something negative will happen that could be shaitan tricking a person okay if um you're doing azkar and uh you have uh a random thought uh for example uh let's say uh you have a thought that uh um that something will happen uh that uh, that uh, somebody's going to accept uh, a proposal for your daughter's wedding for example something like this something that's relevant to you but you weren't thinking about it and it's a random thought that came to your heart while you're doing dhikr this can be from your own self or it could be from allah you can only know after some time has transpired and then you'll say to yourself oh subhanallah when i was praying i had that thought and this way you get to become acclimated with uh how thoughts come into your mind but the first level is when you're doing dhikr or when you have uh when you are remembering allah is that you you are focused your niyyah your tawajjuh is strong your focus is strong and all other thoughts are at rest except the thought that you are yourself thinking this is and when your thoughts are all at rest except for the thought you're thinking it's very easy for that person to determine when some extra thought is coming to their mind and that's from shaitan that's the very easy to do it's, it's not that easy to know when the thoughts that are coming to you if it's not from shaitan is it is it because of your own self or is it some ilham that's taking place it's a little bit harder but usually people have ilham it does happen and has happened throughout history and it's very normal for it to happen but you will only know it's an ilham after the fact meaning you may not know at the moment it's occurring but you will realize that it uh, over time that that was something allah had put in my heart okay so, yeah i think i'll just leave it at that for now jazakallah <laughs> Assalamu alaykum shaykh. Yes. Wa alaykum assalam. So question just briefly uh just a couple of high high on for sharing what you shared. Um question is there any books specifically written on the topic of positive thinking from an Islamic perspective, you know, cuz there's a lot of mindset books that the western world promotes but you know they remove the aspect of the ruh or the nafs and a lot from the equation. So is there anything that you can refer to us alongside of course Quran and the sunnah but that we can look up and also study to read to improve our like faculties of positive thinking yeah i think the most important works on this topic are by imam ghazali rahmatullah alayhi in his ihyal al-muddin um he's delved into this topic quite in a lot of detail a lot of detail so that's my answer okay shukran thank you shaykh
السلام علیکم سے وعلیکم السلام ورحمۃ اللہ اہ اہ یو مینشن ان ویڈیو ان لائک देयर इज अ पॉजिटिव एनर्जी सराउंडिंग अस इफ वी डू नमाज कुरान अस इज देयर एनी रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन दिस एंड द टू एंजल्स गार्डिंग अस एक्चुअली दैट्स अ वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन सो जस्ट एज शैतान ब्रिंग्स इन अ नेगेटिव एनर्जी द एंजल्स हु रियली वी शुड बी सराउंडेड बाय यू सी फॉर अस द रियल द वर्ल्ड वी नीड टू डील विद एज सच इज नॉट द वर्ल्ड ऑफ द जिन्स एंड शैतान आई मीन that is like that's like a defensive position we have uh, but the world that we want to attract and the beings that we want to bring around us are the angels we were your friends the angels said this the angels say to the believers we were your friends in this life in the next world so and when you do azkar it brings the angels when you read quran it brings the angels when you pray it brings the angels so when you bring that positive energy uh it will keep the negative energy away and so um but all of this has to be done holistically it can't be you're doing dhikr of allah but you're like you know but allah is not nice to me so that's going to upset the balance and then you know what fragrances cause positivity uh, what foods create positivity um what environments what people what suhba who you sit with uh who are your friends that create positivity uh what type of work space work environment creates positivity how do you bring positivity into your uh, uh car for example for as much as that can be um these are all questions people have to this is why you need to live your life from you know one easy way to explain it is from one sunnah to the next sunnah you're in the house you're following the sunnahs you go to the car you're following the sunnahs you go into the masjid you're following the sunnahs you go into the bathroom you're following the sunnahs so your your whole life is on the sunnah of the prophet it will help create a positive uh environment for you and over here i want to mention by the way uh that verse of the quran that we were talking about interestingly enough what does that verse say okay uh, regarding thoughts okay uh what the verse mentions uh wa nina billahi dhanna saw they had an evil thought in their hearts about allah so when you have an a in a, 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 a grudge against allah how do you have a grudge against allah then what happens alayhim da'iratu saw around them is an evil circle an evil aura right so now what happens how do you get a grudge against allah basically the way a person feels grudge towards allah is my needs were not met what i wanted didn't happen my expectations didn't happen why is this happening to me why did you do this to me those types of thoughts are the most that's the seed of negativity in your entire life right that i didn't deserve that i don't know why allah allowed that that is the seeds that will uh plant the seeds of a negative a trees a, a forest of negativity in your life so the most important thing to do i'd say like the number one free condition for any type of ruqya is that that person that is doing the ruqya and the person who is listening or reading or you know the person who is affected that they both have a strong acceptance on the qada and qadr of allah I mean whatever allah you know i i don't need what other people whatever allah has written for me is good for me whatever cards allah has dealt with me in life they're good for me and i and you're not and you have a rada whatever allah has written for me is good for me and you have your trust in allah and you see allah as not someone who doesn't meet your needs but you see that allah meets your needs 
is when somebody doesn't in your relationship, the husband and wife, kids and parents. If one feels one person doesn't meet their needs, you start having resentment. If you feel you believe in Allah, but you're like, Allah doesn't do anything I ever want. Well, that, so the, the, the foundation of good thought and positive thought, the foundation of that is to have a good opinion about Allah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> in the Quran they thought a very terrible thing about Allah on them is a very evil circle okay and Allah is angry with them they're angry with Allah because they have a bad opinion about Allah and Allah is also angry with them and Allah has taken his mercy away from them and made them for the hellfire. What an evil destination that is. So it's very, very important that I think in the modern times, uh, I would say the number one precondition not met for Rukia is this, is that somehow, somewhere inside, deep down, we have a resentment towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that resentment, that negativity is going to give birth to negativity in your life every day because your life is not what it's supposed to be according to you. You're not living the life you should have lived. And, you know, and Allah has allowed things for you that you think shouldn't have been. So now you're going to blame Allah. But now Allah has become like a dictator instead of somebody nice. And now Allah wants that because you're angry with Allah, so now Allah is angry with you, and you're angry with yourself. In a sense, internally, you're now suffering as a result of that. So that's the type of negative energy that you definitely don't want. And that's the type of negative energy that will bring shaitan attached, will let shaitan attach you to him in like, like nothing else. You know, this is the type of energy they'll feed off of. Okay, inshallah. Um, yes, so anyone not thinking positively about Allah, this is what shukr is. What is shukr? Shukr is to have shukr, to think positively about Allah. And what's interesting about shukr and st studies and gratitude is that when you have shukr, when you have gratitude, you're thinking in the moment, right? Alhamdulillah for the food, for example. You're thinking in the moment. You're not fearful of the future. You're not thinking of some victimization or something bad that happened to you in the past. When you're thinking shukr, you're thinking positively and you're also in the moment. You're not outside the moment. You're at the moment. You're living the moment. Yeah, it's the lack of, uh, shukr is the lack of depression. Okay, inshallah, I will end here. Aqulu qawli hadha, astaghfirullah li wa lakum, wa li sa'al muslimina wal muslimat. I hope uh, you all were able to appreciate what this, especially the sorceress said about Islam and Muslims. And uh, I hope this will be of benefit to you, inshallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.